If you want to disrupt and transform an institution, uh, maybe the energy industry would be a good place to start the conversation. So our panel here is going to talk about planning for the new energy future and disruptions. Uh, this week, the International Energy Agency in Paris announced that for the first time in history, uh, we've got more renewables uh, in the global energy sector than we have coal. So that's a nice moment in history to celebrate. So to invite Christine Richards to come up with her panel, she's the research director at Z Prime, and she's going to lead this panel through a discussion about planning for new energy futures and disruptions. Christine, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much uh, for, for being here today, and we hope to have a great conversation here around energy and where things are hap heading. Um, and that was, that was actually really exciting to see uh, the conversation about all this creativity and imagination that's going on and how we can bring that back to our communities and cities. And I think that's something at Z Prime that we've really been working hard on is how do we bring that creativity and imagination you know, into the utility industry and into energy and really take an opportunity you know, to transform things. Because right now we're really seeing, um, you know, within cities and, and communities, you know, we're talking about all this innovation and all this change that's happening. And what really enables a lot of that, at least particularly from that technology standpoint, is, is energy. But energy is oftentimes seen as this kind of, you know, slow moving, slow to evolve industry. Um, but there really are a lot of changes that are happening within energy and, and the utility space in particular, what we're finding is that there are really just some difficulties of, of connecting energy and, and connecting some of what's happening within our, our cities and communities, just because of the way that utilities have been structured um, and, and the ways that they, they've been operating. So this is a huge topic. Uh, we have about 40 minutes uh, to try to get through all of this. Um, but we, we really want to focus the conversation around um, that, it's, that it's not just technology. What we're really looking at here in, in instituting some of this change within energy is, is the people aspects, you know, the organizational aspects. What are the roles that, that different groups and people play within energy? And then also talk about the role of, of regulatory and, and, and policy. I think we heard that a little bit earlier that a lot of these changes, you know, it, it's very difficult to enable them if we don't have those right, right structures in place. Um, so I'm very excited to have three great panelists here. Um, with us this morning to help us kind of go through um, this change within energy and, and where things are going. So um, we're going to go down the row here, and I'd love to hear from um, you know, each of you, you know, a little bit about your background and then also your role in, in the energy space and the energy transformation. So Russ, it would be great to hear from you first. Good morning. It's great to be here with all you guys. Uh, Russ Van Oss, I work for a company called iTron, and iTron is the global leader in building automation networks for utilities around the world, electric, gas, water networks, and building smart cities, actually. We've been doing that for about 25 years now, and we have over 200 million electric gas and water meters connected in the world. We woke up a few, few years ago and began to study IoT and the predictions around you know, connected devices and smart cities and the need to collect information and bring that back to a head end. And, analyze data and create applications. And we realized that quite by mistake, we'd built already some of the largest IoT networks in the world that are collecting all this metering data and bringing it back. We're not only automating meters and, and, and bringing back the metering data, but we're also building sensors and put, putting sensors out on the network that actually collects data for looking for leaks, looking for theft, looking for contamination in water systems, looking for contamination around gas, methane leaks, things like that. And there's a tremendous amount of data that finds its way back to the head end, and today it kind of gets delivered to utilities and reams and reams of stacks of paper and really not put to much use. We'll say inside that stack of seven inches of paper is somebody that has a leak or a street corner that might have a leak or someone is stealing from you and then the utility Rich down here on the end is kind of strapped with going through it and finding it. So we found that technology has evolved to the place today where we can build all these networks and they're actually built on uh, a backbone of uh, Cisco technology, which is all IPv6, open, interoperable. And it, it really 
welcomes into the community, into the networks, all kinds of other companies, large uh, companies like my friends at Black & Veatch or Cisco or Microsoft, but also local companies as well where a lot of innovation happens and they can connect to the network or they can extract data from the, the top of the network as well and write applications that you might deliver on a smartphone or on a web or uh, just use the data in any way to be creative. And so we've been working on that very focused on utilities over the last 25 years. And over the last two years, we've been trying to pivot and say, you know what, let's take these networks because they're already out there and they're already available and let's pivot and move into the smart city space and let's take advantage of technology. And I would say that, you know, there, there is plenty of technology here today uh, to solve most of the problems and issues I hear about. What we need to all kind of focus on is for the sake of what? And I think that we get confused. I know a lot of times I'll go to conferences and I'm asked to speak about smart cities. And in reality, I think that's a bad topic. I think we need to be talking about the topic of for the sake of what? And usually that's around sustainability and economic development. So we're really excited about moving kind of into this, uh, this space and, and pivoting from ITRON and trying to build on the last 20, 25 years of experience. So yeah. glad to be here today. Yeah, it's great to have you here. I mean, I think there's that, that technology. I mean, utilities are sitting on a lot of this technology, and there are you know, a lot of opportunities to start leveraging that. Absolutely. That's excellent. Scott. Uh, again, this, I'm Scott Stowler from Black & Veatch. Uh, like Russ, I'm excited to be part of a panel that really focuses on this idea of this transformation and disruption within the utility space. I think uh, my experience in energy is, goes back to 25 plus years of working in centralized generation and operation and maintenance and, op and optimization essentially of conventional generation. The last five years or so have really been focused more on the opposite end of how do we draw in distributed energy resources, create a, me a mechanism and a means for addressing what is ultimately the energy future of a very uh, complementary set of resources at both the distribution end as well as the generation end, and how do we enable all of that in a in a smart and automated way? So focusing a lot on analytics and and managing the idea of strategy of how I go from point A to point B, or how the industry transforms from point A current state to point B future state, and and I would argue the disruption is there. It's happening. Yeah. It's, it's happening in pieces. We're not seeing it as, an, as a necessarily a, a unified movement at this point, but I think we'll talk more about the different pieces as we go forward. Yeah, absolutely. Rich. Hi, everybody. My name is Rich Barone. I am with Hawaiian Electric, and I am responsible for running the demand response department there. Uh, first thing you should know about me, and this may be, may be indicative to some of the, the future state, uh, is that I am not cut from the utility cloth. I've, I've been at Hawaiian Electric for less than two years, uh, having served utilities as a consultant for a few years before that, and overall been in the, in the energy industry, mostly from the uh, IT side of things for just short of a decade, IT and emergent technologies. Hawaiian Electric, uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago now, was ordered by the commission, Public Utilities Commission in Hawaii to, among other things, initiate an integrated demand response portfolio plan the intent of that plan was to promote customer choice, to take advantage of increasing populations of distributed energy resources, and to avoid the need for more uh, thermal units, more conventional fossil fuel, and use these distributed energy resources to help stabilize the grid that's faced with increasing amounts of variable and renewable penetrations. So, it's a new arena, and our charge is really to, in lieu of demand response of yesteryear to deliver a full spectrum of grid services, um, very complex services, interrelated services to try to approximate what uh, the, the operators of the grid are accustomed to using to maintain their grid. It's a big challenge that's not only a technology challenge and a planning challenge, but it's also a challenge with respect to engaging the customer uh, participation and shepherding that into the future. So that's the uh, challenge that we're in the middle of right now, and um, I think it's germane to, to this discussion. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Now, so we have you know, technology solution providers up here, utilities. I mean, how many of you are involved in the, in the energy industry? OK, definitely got some, some hands out there. How many are you from a utility company? Anyone out there? <laughs> OK, all right, Rich, you're. I see one. I see one. <laughs> oh, <there's> one. Okay. <laughs> Oops, I lost my, lost my, 
microphone there. So, you know, what we really want to do here is, is, you know, have that conversation. I think that's the biggest thing that we've seen is just getting all these different groups together, you know, that may be involved in energy and changing um, the future of energy, just having that, that conversation, you know, talking about those, those roles and, and responsibilities. So, um, you know, something I've been trying to do here uh, in a lot of the moderating and, and work that I do is to, you know, try to make things, you know, we talk about high tech and all of these things, and, and I like to try to make it a little bit more, more tangible. So I've, I've, I've brought up a, um, a little pad of paper over here and, and some markers, and I hope we're able to see it, you know, up on this, this screen here. But what I wanted to do was, was take a moment to talk about where are we heading with energy? Um, you know, I do a lot of conferences in the utility industry, and, you know, there's this, I mean, it's not clear, right? I mean, there's technology put out around, you know, smart meters, we're gonna do better billing, but now that future of energy and what it really looks like is becoming, I think, Less, less clear, but there, there's an opportunity to really to, to do some, some changes that I think are important. So what I wanted to do here with the panelists is to have them throw out um, a quick word or two about where we see energy today and, and kind of where energy is going in, in the future. So any, any initial thoughts on where energy is today, a word to describe it? Today I would say it's reliable. Okay. Definitely. Let's see if I can spell reliable. There's no spell check on that, huh? <laughs> yeah, there's no spell checks. All right, what else? Scott? I'd say conventional and largely centralized. Okay, so conventional, centralized. All right, and Rich? I'm going to be very current and call it transitioning. Transitioning. All right. What about from the audience? Anyone? Anyone have some words out there? Invisible? Excellent, that's a great one. You know, it's just something that people, people take for granted, right? I mean, it's out there, it's, it's, it's generally reliable, always on, you know, and so it's kind of hidden. Any other ones? Expensive? Confusing. Confusing. Confusing, polluting, okay. Carbon. Okay, this, I think this is a good list, right? So, I mean, there's uncertainty about it, you know, there's, there's confusion, but I mean, it's generally pretty reliable, but it's, it's primarily based on, on carbon, right? Um, so what about where the future is headed? What, what are some words that, that would describe that? Rich. Transactive. Transactive. What do you mean by transactive? So there's a logical progression to get us there, and it's probably a long ways off. But by transactive, I very simply mean that it's participatory, it's distributed, um, in lieu of it being centralized and sort of the single, single vertical player. Yeah. It's much more diffuse in terms of the participant pool. And Absolutely. somehow coordinated therein. <laughs> Scott. He's taking some of my words when you ask ah. him the definition. It <laughs> makes it tough. Um, obviously diverse, um, yeah. both in terms of technology, but in terms of ownership and motives. Mm -hmm. So it's, you're no longer having a collective unified experience and no longer a collective unified approach to whether it be reliability or focus on what's really important. Different people and different entities have different purposes, and, and microgrids is an example um, of a diversity. But just think of the fact that it is a, it's a very heterogeneous future state. It's very heterogeneous. Yeah. Russ. Yeah, it's probably around the transactive comment, but I would say, you know, choice, because, mm -hmm. you know, transactive, I think, will enable choice. And, and uh, you know, the comments below, it's amazing how negative they are, but, uh, <laughs> It's a pretty amazing thing that has been built here. And it isn't yeah. visible till these lights go out and then it'll be the most visible thing in the room. But I think moving forward, we're gonna all be involved in choice. Yeah, what, what about from the audience? Smart? Renewable? You guys are, it's, it's too fast. Collaboratives. <laughs> Resilient and collaborative. Okay, I think that's a, 
I think that's a good list. I mean, I think this is something that we've seen out there, and we'll get into this conversation a little bit of, of you know, the perceptions around you know, energy and where it is today and you know, where it needs to go in, in the future. But I mean, this is a big jump to go from this model that we've had you know, for 100 plus years to you know, something that's, that's different. And even though we don't entirely know what it is, you know, definitely there's, there's this change. So we're really going to cover this, this space right here. Of, you know, how do we start to make, make that, that, that change? Um, and what I really wanted to talk about was the role of, of you know, new relationships, you know, new partnerships that, that need to start to happen you know, to move to some of those things that we're describing um, up there on, on the top. So um, you know, who's, who's important? Um, and, and moving towards that future, you know, who needs to be a part of this of this conversation? Well, I would say all of you. So, Itron's a technology company, been around for 40 years. We would have four years ago never come to a conference like this, right? We went to technology com conferences and we went to uh, you know to utility kind of focused things, and we worked on real utility operational efficiency problems. Uh, Forums like this are great. Now it's too bad there's only one. There's two utility representatives in here. We need a, we need collaborative involvement from everybody in the community, the community leaders and businesses. We need the utilities, and we need the the uh, public utilities commissions involved because frankly, mm -hmm. they may be the 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 group that needs the most education and needs to be better informed. But I, I would say it starts with all of you, and when you have an interest in it, and I mean when you show up for things like this, I think it's a great first start. Yeah, and, and Rich, how about you? And I'm gonna write some of these up over here as we're going through this. So I'll echo everything that was just said and maybe add a few wrinkles. Um, I, think, I think technologies and technologists and vendors are a hugely important part of the mix as the enablement is, still needs to continue to grow. Yeah. But I'm gonna add that I think all of you, and I look at myself as a consumer of electricity, if you want to get to a transactive state, there's so much complexity uh, associated with even that future state that a notion of, a, of an intermediary uh, to mm -hmm. serve as a proxy on behalf of the uh, you know, electricity consumer or distributed producer is a really important role in, in abstracting and simplifying the engagement that's otherwise still going to remain not just as complex as it is now, but I think increasingly complex with more data, more endpoints, more coordination. It's, it's not going to get simpler. So we're going to need uh, in, in intelligent market participants in the middle to help bridge the gap between the, the, the customers uh, that want to participate and the coordination of the energy itself. Yeah, so the intermediary. I think is, is, is a big one. And you also mentioned customers. I mean, I think that's, that's a huge, huge piece as well in terms of the conversation. Scott. Well, I mean, <clears throat> going last on this one is a little bit of a challenge, but I'll keep adding, <laughs> to, the, I'll keep adding to the picture. So <laughs> strategists, planners, um, I don't think people understand or appreciate or want to understand or appreciate the complexity involved in not only a very different future state, but how do I get there? From current state, and mm -hmm. I think that's a that's a planning problem. That's a confidence problem. That's that's a point where people start to appreciate not only the role of the city and the role of the technologists and solution providers and the role of the utility, but understand just how many uh, hurdles or issues or things have to be navigated and enabled and addressed along that path, and and the timing of various things. I find that you know without people fully understanding the complexity. I have roadmap, visioning, whatever you want to say it, that there's an urgency to put in certain technologies in maybe a completely wrong order or the wrong reason for the wrong purpose. And, and these things have to fit together. We're going to only go through this major transformation of our infrastructure once. I mean, this, is, this distributed transformation to renewable is going to happen. It's going to happen in a big way. But we don't have the money and the opportunity to do it twice. And so getting it right and getting people to understand how these things play together and how these different initiatives and how these different customer groups and how these different entities can participate and when it's ripe for certain different dimensions to, to be in play, I think is absolutely critical. And so I think a lot of the skepticism that exists out there is from a lack of understanding of the complexity of what's really at hand. Yeah, I mean, it seems like there, there are two things that, that, that come out to me from, from what you all mentioned. I mean, one is, 
You know, I mean, we, we have all these, you know, kind of players or, or parties here today. So there is kind of defining those, those new relationships <laughs> among these different groups. And then there's, there's also the piece of, of educating people about the complexities of, you know, delivering energy and delivering reliable power, even if it takes on, on a different model. You know, so, so where have you seen success in, in making some of these changes? I mean, have you seen examples of, of communities and organizations that are, that are starting to, you know, Let's, let's look at the piece first of changing relationships you know, among these different groups. You know, have you seen you know, areas that have had success with that? And what are they doing? Well, I think, Rich, you should talk a little bit about the success of the excitement of the demand response and the customer participation in Hawaii. I think that's probably, in my mind, one of the best examples of where there's a, there's an, there's a functional model evolving to enable direct customer participation, and, and it's a scalable model, and I think that's really an interesting first, maybe one of the first examples I see. Yeah, that. yeah, definitely. Yeah, tell us a little bit more. Thanks, Scott. Um, <laughs> so, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do that, but I'm gonna I'm gonna couch it by saying that the bridge between that last topic and this one is just because the utility is a is a known existing and future participant and stakeholder in this process. I want to underscore the fact that, and this is very much the case in my own utility and likely in others, is that the skill sets aren't necessarily there to get us into that future state, even within the utility. Because whether you're talking about some of the planning processes that Scott alluded to, and frankly, even the dynamic uh, operational requirements of this new paradigm, there's still a lot of internal work that has to happen. So while the, I will talk about some of the successes we've had outbound, I want you to be aware that there's still internal challenges with bringing, you, you have two audiences here really in this effort. One is getting the utility itself to start to climb that hill, and the other is to make sure you have the out, outside understanding and cooperation. What, what, where Scott was alluding to with the excitement is, what's unique uh, about Hawaii is we don't have uh, any kind of wholesale market for energy services or anything like that, no ISO. And so we, therefore, we have nothing to fall back on. First of all, there's no safety net. Second of all, there's no valuation, sort of market-driven valuation for these services. So, so some of the work we're doing is even just creating an assessment of what these things are worth so that we can foster uh, public participation, customer participation. We're working on developing a framework of the services that the grid need and we're creating the ability for people to deliver those services in aggregate or individually through their own customer-sided assets. And this has won a lot of favor with the Public Utilities Commission. They, like, they wanted us to take a market-based approach, and this is our first step in that direction. It's also won a lot of favor uh, among the distributed energy resource vendor community who's been looking for the business model assuredness or the footing that they can make the investments into this market in the longer term, especially when some of the favorable conditions for solar uh, economics are starting to go away. So certainly on the out, outbound facing uh, community, stakeholder communities of the commission and of the intermediaries, mm -hmm. we're making a lot of headway. Those intermediaries are in turn bringing the message downstream or outbound to their potential or existing customers to help tie that off for us. So that we're, we're allowing them, if you will, or encouraging them to help educate the customers on where there will, are and will be opportunities for that kind of transactive uh, coordination. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll, just, I'll just rattle off a list. I mean, certainly I think Hawaii, uh, obviously what you guys have done here in California too, well, I think it's only the beginning. What you've done when bringing renewables on and being able to get that integrated is, is, is this. We're, you know, what this is all about really is vision, collaboration, and then innovation. And if you think about vision, I mean, I, I look at uh, Charlotte and what Charlotte's done with Duke Energy and Piedmont Gas and Charlotte Water, and they've been able to bring in their local community, business leaders, and um, the universities as well. And lots of innovation is being spurned there. And they're spending a lot of time on this visioning topic. And, and it's something I would encourage all of you to think about, like, what do we want the future to look like? Because as I said, I think we can solve it technology-wise with very easily. It's what do we want that end state to look like? Pittsburgh's doing a great job with that. Uh, 
I live in Spokane, Washington, uh, Vista and Spokane and the university there, there have just recently announced a, an in, uh, initiative called Urbanova, which is all around the utilities partnering, partnering together with uh, the local community, business leaders, uh, water, gas, uh, and technology companies to, to build a living laboratory around uh, smart cities. You see it around the world too. I mean, Malta, Barcelona, uh, the, the, there, there are great examples everywhere. You don't have to look that hard to find them, but you have to know what it is you're looking for. And so this visioning part, I think, is really important. And then, uh, you know, it's easy to look at the negatives. I think if we can spend a little bit of time thinking about the positives and where do we want things to go, with, the, with you know, Google and the internet, you can find all kinds of great examples. So, I mean, how do we communicate that to, um, you know, energy, energy customers? I think, you know, a lot of times that I'm, I'm doing, you know, events and, and, and research in the energy industry, and, and people get the complexity of, you know, d delivering power, um, delivering resources to customers. And then, you know, I mean, I talk to my family and people who aren't in the energy industry, and they're just like, well, you know, why can't we just have all solar power all the time? Um, so, I mean, what have you seen in terms of being able to communicate with, uh, you know, citizens and, and customers about, you know, the, the complexity of, of energy and what's, what's involved? I and mean, what needs to happen there? <laughs> we were just encouraged not to focus on the negative. Um. <laughs> well, I think it's just, it's not that it's, I think it's not that it's the negative piece. It's just that there, I mean, like we saw on that list, I mean, there's, you know, there's confusion, it's invisible. I mean, people don't really have that visibility. Yeah, sorry, I was just being a little cheeky because <laughs> I, so uh, my wife is a journalist who I, I think is pretty, pretty capable of discerning uh, nuances and technical stuff. And, and I'm even trying to explain to her over dinner weekly why uh, solar is a challenge for us to manage. The, the bottom line is it's not easy stuff to communicate. I mean, demand response, what the heck is that? I mean, I, people ask me, I've been working for months now on a, crafting a message that explains in a sentence what I do. Um, and that's just one portion of this complexity. I guess what I'm saying is it's really difficult to communicate. It takes a lot of patience and it takes ma many hands make light work. Yeah. Um, to some extent, we've leveraged the intermediaries and their relationships and their inclination towards these economic opportunities to help us, but it's a, it's a slippery slope because they have a vested interest in, in overly simplifying uh, maybe the value proposition for customers uh, and maybe not doing the complexity a service. Uh, so we're trying to align with, with them. If we can compensate for the complexity that they're helping to deliver, then they can effectively work to communicate that complexity to the customers. But beyond that, it just takes a lot of pounding of the pavement, talking with your regulators, working with state energy office, working with, with uh, you know, city and local officials, uh, all of the, the, the usual suspects in terms of stakeholders, making sure we continue to focus on the education because it's got to it's start from the ground up. Maybe to add to that a little bit, um, one of the things we're really good at as a society is picking off the low-hanging fruit. And so when someone sees a solar panel on a roof, they assume it's a pretty straightforward, pretty low-tech thing. Lots of solar panels. Virtually everyone in the state of Hawaii, it seems like, has a solar panel. Some are, pop, are absolutely horribly aligned to the sun. doesn't really matter. They still put them on their roof. Um, so there's this, there's this premise that I can solve a very complex problem very incrementally and I don't have to worry about complexity. And so I've got this, this, this opportunity to, to see solar as being very, very easy. Um, the fact that solar is highly variable is not apparent to the person in their house. They're not seeing the lights flicker. They're not, their TV is not, not operating because of the variability. There's, there's compensating services from the grid or whatever that make that experience seem very, very simple. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have a skepticism when we talk about complexity, and we also have a skepticism on worrying about the long term when we're trying to make short term advancements. And I think that actually complicates the story because it's, if you get confident, you don't have to worry about the complexity, you end up in very unusual endpoints, right? You end up at a point where you extrapolate, uh, like, like in Hawaii, where so many people put solar panels on the roof, it became a very, very difficult device to control. And people could not understand or grasp how that could have ever happened because they don't see or understand the scale. So I think skepticism and trust 
and belief and understanding are all things that have to be overcome and managed. And I think that really does revolve around the community and the community mind and this visioning and understanding at a vision that this is a, a big opportunity, but it's also a complicated path. And, and I think once that complexity is, is appreciated and, and sponsored by city leaders and appreciated that there's a short-term and a long-term side of the story, I think it starts to become easier to socialize. Yeah. I would say two things. So I think that it is incredibly complex and we want it simple. And I think the best intermediary to explain that and get involved is, is the local utility. They're in, your, they're in your local communities and they've been there for 100 years and they're the right ones, they understand it. They're the right ones to assemble community forums like this, local community forums where they, they uh, explain the complexities I would also say, number two, to the utilities. Now, I'll go a little negative, Rich. I mean, the utilities have to stop thinking about all of us as ratepayers and start thinking of us as consumers. I think you're doing that in Hawaii, and I applaud you for that, but you don't find that kind of thinking everywhere. And if the leaders of the utilities will think about their consumers as that, a consumer base, and that they have this incredible brand that's been there for 100 years, they have this incredible ability to manage large-scale projects and to reduce complexity to the fact that when I throw on the light switch, the lights do come on. That means I need to, just like I described ITRON earlier, as we're pivoting in this space, the utility the leadership can think about it that way as well. Mm -hmm. And then all this solar stuff won't be a fear anymore. The renewables won't be a fear like in Hawaii. And we'll find a whole new way to market to our consumer base. We'll find all kinds of new products to sell to them and it'll be a win-win for everybody so collaboration but you know let's not view the utility as the enemy because I think they're actually the way we achieve this smart future that I know I want for my grandchildren yeah and I, I think some of it too is just the I mean we've talked a lot about the relationship with with the customers and the citizens but I mean, a lot of the way you know, utilities have been structured for a long time is, is built around you know, policy and, and regulation and the way that, it, that it's been approached. I mean, what are some of the changes you're seeing in that area? Or what, are, what are some of the changes that, that need to happen just to enable that, you know, more of that, that relationship? Um, I'm going to just harken back to what I alluded to earlier. The commission really, to their credit, pushed us towards a market-based approach. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, we're speaking specifically around DR and the utilization of distributed energy resources. I think that's where the rubber hits the road. At the end of the day, uh, we'll, we'll use these tariffs as a proxy for that market until we understand how liquid and how deep that market can be. We could transition into other models from there. And so in this instance, we are given the encouragement, in fact, the order to go ahead and pursue this. I'm not sure um, if, that, if, if other jurisdictions are that aggressive, but I do think that that's, that's an example, but more globally, regulatory reform. What, what I've noticed in my couple of years at the utility about the regulatory process is that it is a bit difficult from a timing perspective to be nimble and to move and to transition and pivot as the market itself and technologies do because the regulatory process itself isn't really built that way. So I do think there's a degree of regulatory reform that's needed to make the regulating body as nimble as the utility needs to be in order yeah. to accommodate the market conditions changing. Yeah, absolutely. Good. We have a question. So in the spirit of regulatory reform and big, <laughs> big ambitious goals for um, Madam President, uh, after November 8th. So <laughs> let's say that you got a call from uh, the White House saying, you know, we want the new Secretary of Energy to spend the first 50 days doing big, audacious things that will get us faster to the kind of utility and uh, post-utility future that you're describing. Can you each say, when you get that call, What's the one thing, you got not only one thing to say to the new Secretary of Defense, I'm sorry, Secretary of Energy uh, here in the United States. It's potentially a global recommendation, of course, but uh, we're, we are going to go through an administration shift here. So is there one thing that you just wish the federal government did that would free up and, and make the transformation that you're talking about more possible? Well, my list is pretty long, so to think about one. Uh, <laughs> 
you know, it clearly is this regulatory reform. And I, I, I guess I would say to them, let's move out of this kind of rate making. I know that's what they're charged with. But because all we can think about is how to provide the lowest cost rate structure, we limit our thinking. So it's back to the visioning and what do we want? And so today at ITRON, we would talk about, let's build a network, one network that can do electric, gas, water, streetlights, parking, all this kind of stuff. And it sounds wonderful. Everybody wants to do it. But our regulatory body prohibits it because we built this network to read electric and therefore we're not going to allow the streetlights to connect to it. That's back to the ratepayer kind of view of things. So if we quit thinking about them as electric ratepayers, but citizens in the community, let's build a network that anybody can use that we can all benefit from. By the way, we'll eliminate a ton of waste that will pay for more things to do. So let's, let's shape or reshape or rethink how we think about people that are using this asset. Well, we didn't ask how many regulators were in the audience, so we, so <laughs> yeah. we, all, we can all pick we up regulators. We won't offend any. Right? We won't offend any. I, I mean, I do believe that the regulation was built for a different purpose and built for assuring long-term viability of investments, and, and it's kind of an oxymoron to, to try to overlay that kind of decision process against a very dynamic and very transformational space, right? Because as everything gets built, its role in life will change undoubtedly over the next 25 years. If I'm building storage or distributed energy resources, there is no static forward model that, that says I'm going to protect the value or I'm going to assure that the value or the role of this asset stays, stays the same. It's a fundamentally different kind of thinking. It's a different kind of industry. Um, I think the regulators are trying, I do think, in a lot of states to address a new frontier with a, a conventional or, an, or, a, non, or a, a way of looking at long-term investment. I do think of fundamentals of looking at what's foundational to enable the future and, and, and actually finding a way to accelerate that is actually the key to the thing. So unlocking certain technology options and allowing that to progress, enabling customer participation at a greater scale, some of those things I think are, are no-brainers and they should not be hard to get through the process, but they currently are. Rich. You won't be quoted in the newspaper for this. That's, that's good. I mean, and, and now I understand Scott's problem with going last. Um, so if, if I got that call, first thing I would say is th this is a tremendous, tremendous uh, call. Thank you very much. And nobody cares more or respects more about the energy in this country than me. I would, I would start with that. In the, in the, um, then I would, say, uh, I would say, I would argue that conceptually regulatory reform as it pertains to uh, the IOU structure being uh, afforded the opportunity to take certain risks with some, either some downside protection or being made whole through rate recovery are good ways to kind of tweak the equation. I think investments do need to change, whether it be the, the network itself, but at the end of the day, what I think there needs to be an emphasis on is the data, the yep. data collection, the internet of things, the collection of data and the analysis thereof, I think that that is a foundational tenant to this future. And so that investments and efforts, uh, regulatorily or otherwise, need to be pointed in that direction as, as the, the primary building block. So that's where I would start. Okay. All right, I'm sending that message to him. <laughs> All right, we have about a minute left here. So, so, so last, last question. Great, okay, thank you so much. I'm Kathleen O'Dell with Deloitte. I wanted to ask, what does this new energy future um, bring in terms of opportunities for greater inclusiveness within a sector that's maybe not traditionally thought of as highly inclusive, whether it could be around the workforce within some of the major utility, regulatory, and other players, or whether it's around entrepreneurs and small businesses and the way we engage with them around new technologies and services, or perhaps even on the customer engagement side to actually reach uh, new segments of customers that perhaps haven't been uh, part of the conversation before. You want to go first? Not particularly, but I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm, I tend to be, I'm, I'm partial to the, the last target of your question. From a utilities perspective, one of the things we, especially in the era of, you know, the distributed generation realm, where you really do have uh, some economic justice concerns, right? And you have, you have cost transfer happening all the time. And it seems like there are the haves to a large extent that have the opportunity to in make the investments. And then people, uh, other folks maybe that don't have that same opportunity are being, uh, being burdened with a larger percentage of costs. So from my perspective, 
it's, it's, I'd call it an opportunity, but first of all, it's a challenge. It's a challenge for uh, the, the utilities and frankly the communities as a whole to figure out uh, mechanisms through which there can be participation, whether this is through community-based renewable energy projects and the financing of those projects and, and loan opportunities or grant opportunities to afford people who either don't have the capital, don't have the real estate or space to participate in this arena, figure out a way to, to accommodate that. I think therein, if you just look at that one sliver, there are ample opportunities for innovation, the entrepreneurial sector, for, for outreach, uh, community work, communications, and there will be portions of the utility workforce that are going to fall into a category of increasingly uh, obsolete, right? Because there are going to be functions that the utilities are going to do less and less of and focus in different arenas. I think that this is an opportunity to transition the workforce without enduring uh, economic hardship. So I think it can be a win-win scenario. That would be one direction I would focus on. Really quick, I think you can't <laughs> argue with inclusion without talking about transportation and mobility. It's a huge new participant in this game. As electrification of vehicles and mobilization of transportation becomes a bigger and bigger play, that's a natural, that's a, that's a new way to enter into this inclusive space. It's through a different set of customer experiences and a different set of economics. Thank you. I agree. I mean, there's no way. It, it, what we're talking about is collaboration, and if we're going to paint a picture of the future, it's got to be inclusive, and we're talking about innovation. We all know innovation doesn't reside in one spot. We need everybody included for, to achieve that. So, yeah. Yep. Christine, yeah. can we take the two questions and then discuss over lunch? Yeah, that sounds, so that sounds great. Tell us so. your pithy questions, and then we have hungry stomachs to feed. Yes, yes, or between lunch. Yes. You asked too hard <laughs> questions, by the way. This isn't fair. <laughs> Thank you, Scott, for introducing transportation. This energy panel has been almost entirely about electricity, which is only about one-third of our energy supply. We're now assuming that electric vehicles are going to somehow fill that next big third, which is where most of our oil consumption is used for transportation. And yet those electric vehicles, electric drivetrains, may be fueled by hydrogen or ammonia made from renewable source energy. So please help us clean up our language so that when we don't confuse ourselves and the public when we speak about energy and we're really talking about electricity and vice versa. How can we clean up our language so we don't confuse ourselves, the public, and the, and the decision makers? Thank you. Good lunch Bye. discussion. We've got a table, at least one of table, that's going to focus on this question. Okay. Hi, Gil Friends, City of Palo Alto. Uh, so we've seen a lot of industries substantially disrupted in the past 10 years, and there are those who say that the, that the utility industry is facing substantial disruption as well. And some companies are, are embracing that and moving toward a service delivery model. Some companies are retrenching to transmission and distribution and saying let third parties do the services. And a lot of companies are digging in their heels and saying this will not change. But the record of the last 10 years suggests that's not a pretty safe idea. So how does an industry that's typically massive capital investment, long lead times, slow to change, for many good reasons, including safety, how does that kind of industry embrace the challenges of disruption that it's facing? Excellent. Well, leave it to the city of Palo Alto to give us that question. <laughs> Thank you, Gil. Thank you to our panelists and to our moderator. We appreciate this very much. It's good food for thought. And now uh, the transition to lunch. Jesse? Right. Thanks, you guys, so much.